On January 15, 1919, more than 150 people were injured and 21 died in a flood in Boston, Massachusetts. This wasn't just any flood. It was a 40-foot, 26 million pound, 2.3 million gallon tsunami of thick, sticky molasses. Slower than molasses in January? Not on this day. Boston was a very busy harbor in the early 1900s, and molasses was a popular product both as a sweetener and after proper processing in industrial uses. In fact, before World War I, molasses was the most popular sweetener in America due to the high cost of white sugar. Molasses would be hauled in ships from the Caribbean, unloaded into storage tanks, and later transferred to train tank cars. Usually the trains would haul the molasses to distilleries or manufacturing plants. In 1915, the U.S. Industrial Alcohol Company built a 50-foot-tall, 90-foot diameter storage tank at 529 Commercial Street in Boston. The tank was near the harbor, making offloading from ships convenient. Here molasses would be stored before delivery to its subsidiary, Purity Distilling Company, located in Cambridge, Massachusetts. There, the molasses was processed to produce ethanol for use in alcoholic beverages. Think rum, for instance, and in the production of cordite, necessary for making ammunition and artillery shells. The tank was built with large curved sheets of steel riveted together. The bottom of the tank was set in concrete, and it leaked. Apparently from the very beginning, people including children would take cups and pails and collect the leaking molasses to take home. When the Purity Distilling Company found out about this, they painted the tank brown to disguise the leaking. Many who worked in the very busy area and who lived nearby would hear the tank shudder every once in a while and groan as it was filled, but life went on and everyone seemed used to the tank and its noises by 1919. On January 14th, the ship had delivered a load of molasses to the tank. The molasses had been warmed to make it easier to pump, and the tank was partially full of older, colder molasses when the new shipment was pumped in. The additional delivery was approximately 600,000 gallons, which just about filled the tank to capacity. The next day, January 15th, after days of frigid weather and temperatures suddenly rose above 40 degrees. Around 12.30 p.m., the molasses tank burst open, People in the air described the noise as a roar, a growl, crash, thunderclap, and then, as rivets popped, what they thought were gunshots or machine guns firing. And then came the wave of thick, sticky molasses. It was between 25 and 40 feet high and moved at an estimated 35 miles an hour. It was strong enough to push buildings off their foundations and crush them. Some of the steel from the tank was blown into a support for the nearby elevated train tracks, nearly tossing a train right off the tracks. A nearby fireboat station collapsed and a firefighter on duty drowned in the molasses, unable to free himself from the debris. People were thrown many feet by the initial blast of air whooshing from the tank. Bridget Cloutree died when her home collapsed from the force of the wave. Her three children and several lodgers would survive the initial collapse but one child died months later from his injuries. Some were working near the tank and were thrown into the harbor. Some were crushed by debris. Some would die later from infection, suffered after breathing, swallowing, or even having wounds contaminated by the sticky molasses. As the wave continued, it cooled from the air temperature, making it thicker and more difficult to escape. It was waist deep in places, thick and sticky, and overwhelmingly sweet and smelling. It was like quicksand. People said later that the harder people struggled to get out, the deeper they got in. Many horses and other animals were trapped and died. Men, women, and children tried to save each other, but it clogged the nose, mouth, ears, and the force of the goo and debris it carried was too difficult to get away from if you were caught. The USS Nantucket was docked at a nearby pier. 
116 cadets were dispatched for rescue operations. They pulled people from the muck and set up a perimeter to keep people away from the danger area. Army and Navy personnel, the Red Cross, and police were also arriving to help. It was slow, dangerous, and physically difficult work. The molasses was now thick and full of debris and bodies. Reports said some nurses from the Red Cross actually dove into the molasses pond to save as many as they could. So many were wounded that a field hospital was set up in a building nearby to treat them. Doctors and nurses worked around the clock. The search went on for four straight days and nights. Some of the victims were so coated in the molasses that they were difficult to identify. Bodies blown into the harbor continued to wash onto the coast for several months. People in the area had difficult breathing from the clinging, sweet smell and developed coughs and lung problems. They used seawater pumped by fireboats to clean up the messy goo and sand to absorb what they could, where they could. Everything was covered. It was said the whole city of Boston was sticky and brown and stunk of molasses. It stuck to everything and was tracked everywhere on people's and animals' feet. Hundreds worked in the cleanup effort. It took an estimated 87,000 hours to clean everything the molasses contaminated. Within days, one of the first class action lawsuits in Massachusetts had been filed against the U.S. Industrial Alcohol Company. Investigations and hearings would continue over six years. The company claimed the tank had been blown up because of the connection to the manufacturing of ammunition. This claim was thoroughly debunked. According to a U.S. Census Bureau report published on their website in January of 2019, U.S. industrial alcohol was eventually ordered to pay the victims $1 million. The equivalent in today's dollars would be roughly $16 million. Following the disaster and lawsuit, new standards for the construction of industrial storage facilities was enacted by many local, state, and even federal government agencies. More than 100 years after the Boston molasses flood, the causes are still studied and argued today. Recent studies claim a multitude of problems doomed the structure from the very beginning, including using steel half as thick as it should have been, bad rivet design, and cracks due to pressure. The tank had never been tested properly and had only been filled to capacity a few times before the catastrophe. It was a disaster waiting to happen, and when it did, the results were catastrophic. For many years after the flood, residents of Boston could smell the molasses if the wind was right. Some say you can still smell the molasses in certain areas of the city on hot and humid days. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe.